Hi everyone and um, thank you very much for joining this webinar with us today. Uh, this is the fourth webinar in a series and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that series shortly but my name is Amanda Lake and I am um, leading our Climate Smart Utilities uh, subgroup on greenhouse gas monitoring and I'm also a, um, a process engineer with Jacobs based in Edinburgh in Scotland and so it's great to be here and we've got a really nice panel today of presentations. Um, from process emissions to planetary boundaries. So just a few administrative notes first. Uh, this, this webinar will be recorded and um, on demand and the uh, materials and uh, other, other sole responsibility of speakers and don't reflect the um, opinion of Iowa. And um, during the webinar, if you'd like to um, raise questions, please use the Q&A box and um, please use your chat box for general questions for um, for issues uh, with, if you've got any issues, but please use the Q and A box for questions. And all of microphones will be muted, um, and we we can't, uh, we're not going to have hands raised. Um, but yeah, please raise your questions at any point, and we, we're going to come back to those after each presentation. So I'm going to give a just a very brief overview of the series that has led to this fourth webinar, and then we're going to hear from Owen uh, on on life cycle assessment in. Uh, wastewater treatment and then we're going to hear uh, another case study from uh, Maria and a final case study uh, from, from Jakob and Inga and so a really great practical, some theory but also really great practical examples of applying going beyond uh, greenhouse gas accounting and life cycle carbon to wider use of uh, life cycle frameworks in supporting decision making in water resource recovery facilities. And then I'm going to give a, a brief overview to the um, to the recent white paper that we published as a Climate Smart Utilities uh, subgroup. Of and uh, after each speaker, we'll take five minutes of Q&A and then we'll have a little bit of time at the end for discussion as well. So it uh, should be a great um, approximately hour and a half. We, we may finish a little, a little earlier, but we've, uh, we've got an hour and a half slot. So I'm sure it will be a great, um, a great uh, discussion. So these are our speakers today and each of them will introduce themselves um, as their turn comes. And I uh, just want to thank all of our speakers again. It's great to have you here. And just as an overview for people who aren't aware, uh, this is the fourth webinar um, in a series that we've had, um, which has really focused on bringing the um, Nordic experience to on both greenhouse gas accounting, but also wider um, uh, life cycle assessment and um, wider decision making approaches because it, it started from um, the World Congress last year in Copenhagen where we had a great uh, Climate Smart Utilities workshop and there were just so many fantastic examples and particularly the uh, this road towards a Nordic climate neutral water sector that we thought um, which was a document that was published um, and Jakob and Anna Katrine had a great um, a, a large role in producing this um, we thought that it would be very useful to share this document as well as experience specifically on a really key topic um, in greenhouse gas accounting, which is process emissions of nitrous oxide and methane. So these are the three webinars we've had so far. So the first one was um, the Nordic experience, which really gave an overview of that um, document on greenhouse gas accounting by um, Nordic countries that you can see to the left. That's the document and that's available online. We could post a link in the chat. And then we had a first webinar, which really shared that. Um, a second webinar, which was focusing on monitoring and mitigating methane. And um, again, drawing on Danish lessons for, for global action. And then the third webinar, which we had um, last month, was monitoring mitigating nitrous oxide. Again, sharing sharing the, the lessons from Denmark. And then here, what we're really doing is um, showing how, in particular, um, process emissions, but wider greenhouse gas accounting, and in fact, wider uh, life cycle assessment beyond carbon can be used in um, decision-making in water resource recovery facilities and and again, withdrawing on experience from, uh, in particular, from Denmark. And, and then just a final, the, the document on the far right there is in the slide is, um, is a recent white paper that our working group have released. And this really tries to summarise, um, provide links to a lot of this information as well and really summarise um, some what we hope is really interesting information and, and useful practical guidelines for utilities, both on greenhouse gas accounting, but also on these kind of wider frameworks and 
uh, decision making processes that we so desperately need as we as we try to take climate action, but also action on wider biodiversity and social social crises as well. So with that, I think I will um, pass across to our first speaker, and it's my pleasure to hand across to Owen, who will introduce himself. And um, thanks very much, Owen. Uh, thanks very much, Amanda. Um, so my name is um, Owen Clifford and uh, I work in the University of Galway, um, which is on the west coast of Ireland. I'm actually based at the moment in the Netherlands in 2023, but um, would normally be working from there. Um, and, and oh yes, okay. So basically just a little bit of my background. Um, so I'm the head of civil engineering in University of Galway and um, in today's talk, I'm also presenting um, on behalf of a spin-out company from our research group called Water Vortex Solutions. So this is a this case study is a project by my uh, research group in the university and our um, spin-out company. Uh, my background is in process engineering in water and wastewater, uh, both an academic and industrial background. And I suppose in in uh, my group in the university, we cover everything from fundamental research up to almost full-scale research. So we do do quite a lot of um, large-scale uh uh, product development, technology development as well. So I'm just going to give a little bit of a background on um, life cycle assessment, but literally two slides. Um, I'm sure a lot of people maybe in the audience know about it, but just in case, just to uh, set the scene for that. So um, basically ISO uh, 14040 has what I think is a pretty good um, definition of life cycle assessment. So it's a compilation an evaluation of the inputs and outputs and the potential uh, environmental impacts of a product system throughout its life cycle. And what do we mean by its life cycle? Well, it starts with resource and raw material extraction, goes through processing, manufacturing, uh, distribution, use, and then end of life. And ideally, a full life cycle assessment would look at all these um, elements of a product or a system. Let's move on, yeah. Um, so kind of breaking that down a little bit, when you're actually trying to model, uh, produce a life cycle assessment model of a particular process or a product, you're going to have um, inf inputs such as raw materials, uh, for example, water, um, you might have manufacturing facilities, electricity, heat, and you might have land use, chemicals, and there are many other things. They go into making the product and process that you're trying to model. And the outputs from that can be things like emissions to the, air, to the air, emissions to water, such as wastewater. There can be chemical and solid waste emissions. But you can also have things like uh, heat recovery from your process. And a lot of your um, waste material may not indeed be waste. It may be recyclable uh, material as well. I'm just going to put on the pointer. Sorry. And... One of the key aspects when you look then at a life cycle assessment model is what is the actual model boundary going to be? So as I said before, ideally we'll try and look at the entire product life cycle, but this may not be possible. And so in some cases you may look at what's called cradle to gate. So this is looking at raw materials to the manufacturing facility gate. There might be cradle to consumer, which is, I guess, taking it a step further, looking at the distribution processes. And then you have cradle to grave, which will be the entire life cycle and one of the key uh, things to remember in life cycle assessment is the, the functional unit uh, choice and what you're trying to do is model the impacts per some functional unit and that might be uh, one 500 milliliter water bottle for example uh, delivered to the consumer it could be per kilometer driven if you're looking at car transport or in this case we're going to see later on it could be per kilogram oxygen entrained in a wastewater treatment uh, system Sorry, just moving on. Okay, uh, so some of the drivers for life cycle assessment from academic uh, point of view, um, I suppose it allows us an opportunity to really holistically look at an overall measurement of system impacts and product impacts on the environment. Uh, it can drive innovation and mitigation, and it's also very useful in trying to uh, develop policy uh, particularly policy that will help us towards uh, net zero in the future. Uh, for industry, uh, again, for in, for some uh, industry, it's going to be increasingly required at tendering stage. And that's one of the case studies I'm going to give you today in the wastewater sector. Uh, again, it can drive, like in academia, it can drive innovation and, and efficiency, both technology innovation, but also process efficiency. 
and will be also from a marketing and business point of view important for it can be important for environmental credentials and for utilities uh, can be part of the requirement for carbon reporting it can be part of the modeling processes then it can help drive green tendering processes within utilities and can be used to model assets to try and reduce the overall life cycle costs and impacts and there will be some examples of that today So, but there are obviously some challenges with life cycle assessment. If there weren't, uh, we'd, uh, it would be widely applied. And I guess it's not particularly widely applied at this stage. Uh, it's messy and complex uh, to begin with. It's not easy to do, in many cases, a uh, really accurate life cycle uh, model. Another challenge is kind of trying to fairly comp compare two uh, products, for example, or two systems. Because as I said before, the uh, boundaries that you've modeled might be different. Are you comparing the same functional unit, et cetera? A key challenge and perhaps the biggest challenge is uh, the data that you can use. So to what degree do you have accurate data available? And unfortunately, with life cycle assessment, like with any model, the outputs of the model are obviously highly dependent on the accuracy of what you put into the uh, model itself. And then the expertise, is there the available expertise in the organization to actually accurately uh, do the model, develop the model, but also assess that the model is correct. So that's just a, a little uh, background into the process of life cycle assessment. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uh, uh, detail behind all this, but moving on to the particular case study that I'm going to talk about today. Apologies, the slides are just uh, moving a little bit slowly. Okay, so this case study is going to uh, focus on aeration. And so aeration, as we all know, probably here is a key component in wastewater treatment in, in that it underpins a lot of the biochemical processes that occur in a treatment plant. It's key for process control, uh, for example, control of not just aerobic, but also anaerobic pro or uh, anoxic processes as well. Uh, in this case, the lack of aeration being one of the key things. Uh, it's a major energy, energy consumer, uh, generally the biggest energy consumer in a wastewater treatment uh, facility, and it has the ability to impact wider wastewater treatment plant emissions such as nitrous oxide. So in this particular study, uh, case study, I'm going to show you, we developed a life cycle assessment uh, model for an aeration product installed at a large wastewater treatment plant. And the idea was to measure the entire life cycle impacts of uh, this aeration system as installed and operated over a 40 year period in um, the wastewater treatment plant. As far as we know, it's the first such specific study like this, although I stand to be uh, corrected on that if there are other examples. So the wastewater treatment plant in question was a retrofit of actually 100,000, excuse me, I made a typo there, population equivalent uh, wastewater treatment plant. And the utility, the requirement uh, was that the utility wanted an embodied carbon statement from the supplier. And so the supplier came to us in the university, uh, that, uh, the supplier being Vortec, to actually develop this life cycle assessment model. So the life cycle assessment was carried out over the full product life cycle with some parts left out, as I'll talk about in a minute, using EcoInvent uh, database, version 3.9 and Simicro. And just below, I'm not going to go through them all, but kind of shows you a non-exhaustive list of the various product stages that were modeled and some of the inputs that were modeled. So as part of the actual uh, model itself, the parts that I've outlined here in green were included in the embodied uh, carbon uh, element, which was required uh, by the utility. The parts that are in red, which was um, installation and maintenance and the actual equipment replacement during operation for example if a pump had to be replaced every 10 years or 15 years were left out although at the end of the the model we found they would likely be negligible anyway and the parts in orange um i am presenting today but they weren't included as part of the what the utility required but we did run a life cycle assessment model for the actual operation uh part of the um aeration uh, system. So to give you an idea of some of the inputs, we used inventory data. So this is data from the actual uh, EcoInvade database itself, where we didn't have bespoke data. We used inventory data and also things like the grid carbon intensity 
um, of the country, the area where we were going to install this. Uh, we use bespoke data around a uh, bill of materials. So what exactly went into manufacturing the product itself? In fact, we managed to pretty much um, model every single washer, uh, bolt, seal, et cetera, that went into the product. And very importantly, data from uh, equivalent sites relating to the oxygen transfer efficiency of this product. And also we use data from mixed sources for things like transport, et cetera. We had two functional units, one which was which is per kilo oxygen entrained in wastewater for a system operating for 40 years. And the second one was uh, per aeration product installed. So two different units. Um, for the purposes of the results I'm going to show you today, it, it doesn't really impact uh, the graphs, but just for information, we um, use two different uh, functional units. And so to uh, quickly go through some of the results, as you can imagine from the model, there will be a lot of uh, different types of results. But one of the uh, powerful things about life cycle assessment, as opposed to carbon modeling, is that we're able to look at the impacts across a whole wide range of different areas. So what I'm showing here are two graphs, one which takes a 40 year view of the product. And during that 40 year uh, period, parts of the product may, might have to be upgraded, et cetera. And the other one takes a one year um, operational view of the product where it includes the embodied carbon plus one year of operation. And you can see that over uh, both time periods that almost all the impacts relate to climate change which is uh, greenhouse gas emissions and resource use uh, due to uh, including fossil fuels. And that, as we'll see later on, mainly comes from electricity, which is used in the manufacture of the product and also operating the product. Other key impacts would be things like acidification and ecotoxicity. I should uh, mention here as well that we, we are only uh, looking at the manufacture and operation of the product and we didn't we're not estimating here the actual off gases from the wastewater treatment uh, plant itself so you can see that when it comes to uh, this particular aeration system that most of the impacts will be around climate change and resource usage regardless of whether it's operated for one year or 40 years and there's a particular reason for that that i'll cover in a second so for the embodied carbon and this is a key interest both to this was of interest to utility but also to the uh, company um, itself who supplied the product because it enables them maybe to target areas that they need to uh, in they can innovate on to maybe reduce the embodied carbon in their products we see that most of the uh, impacts for climate change resource use ecotoxicity etc occur during the manufacture stage um, and the fabrication stage and also during the manufacture of uh, the actual material manufacture stage. So that's not raw material extraction. It's actually the stage that brings it from raw material extraction to produce, in this case, steel that was used in making the product or in the uh, conversion of recycled steel into steel that's useful uh, in the, for this particular product. So they are the two key headings. Transport was insignificant, for example, and uh, steel production, and as I said, fabrication were key contributors. However, I think the key uh, result from the analysis itself was that when we looked at the overall impacts and the different product stages that these impacts occurred for, you can see that almost all, in fact, 99.9% .9 occur at operation and maintenance stage. And given that our estimate was that the actual maintenance of the product would be negligible, this is that operation stage, and that's electricity usage. So virtually in operating an aeration system, and it doesn't really matter what type of product it is, almost all of the impacts are going to be at operational stage. The embodied uh, impacts are negligible. Now for the product supplier, they are very important, but for the utility, they will be negligible. So things like electricity mix is a key input variable. And very importantly, the oxygen requirements and transfer efficiency are key. The other thing we looked at is the level of data accuracy and the importance of that data to the model itself. And in that, we could see that for future models, we would try and improve, for example, future modeling of the carbon intensity of the electricity grid would be one area we'd look at, because as we can see, that's highly relevant and also trying to improve the modeling around the manufacturing fabrication, which will probably actually mean that the impacts were lower than expected. I think we probably overestimated at that um, in both of those stages. So some of the conclusions uh, from the model itself, um, from the, the case study itself, 
is that for utilities, for example, uh, techno technology selection when it comes to aeration systems must favour technologies that are efficient and allow flexible operation if you are to reduce emissions because almost all of the emissions occur uh, at uh, operation stage. And a key thing is that when you are modelling and doing life cycle assessment modelling for aeration systems, that they need to be, the model needs to be based on equivalent data from reported from other uh, wastewater sites and not on clean water data. So a lot of uh, modelling occurs using uh, oxygen transfer efficiencies for, through clean water, which to be honest is irrelevant when you're looking at the life cycle assessment uh, modelling because it vastly overestimates the efficiency on site. Uh, for industry, uh, key, I suppose, take homes from this will be a uh, full uh, impact analysis will be necessary of products in the future and already in the construction sector that's going on to a pretty good extent. And it can and should drive efficiency. I know the company, the product supplier, are already looking at the model outputs and to see how can they, they can improve their model efficiency. And I guess uh, to, uh, just the last slide here is just our last part is that there are I guess some challenges with this these approach and using life cycle assessment at tender and design stage. How does the utility, for example, ensure like by like comparison? Do the companies have the in the in-house skills to do life cycle assessment? And how can we be sure of quality control to ensure that the models and the data that the utilities receive are accurate? So uh that's it for me, just to thank the project team and the funders. Thank you. Thanks very much, Owen. Um Really interesting, and um, yeah, I've never seen this. Never seen this for for aeration plants specifically. So I think it's fascinating. Um, is it the first time you've presented it, or? Uh, yeah, it's the first time we presented you. Like we will in the future present more detailed figures and more details on the site itself. But it's kind of literally um, at installation commissioning stage. So. Oh, nice. Very nice. Um, right, we have a few. We do have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to take the initiative because I have questions. Um, if anyone does, I can't see anyone post have been posted any. But if you've you've got a few minutes to do that, or else we'll pick up at the end as well. But oh, and one um, question I had is around the assumed that assumed uh, deterioration or diffuser replacement over over the life cycle of the diffusers, I guess the replace from what you've said, the replacement itself, the materials in the diffusers, probably not the issue, but that reduct the you know the the drop off in efficiency, and also um, yeah, I just wondered, did you factor in that um, throughout those forty years, and what assumptions, I guess you yeah, what assumptions you made, and then also I guess around the grid energy, I assume you assume some sort of decarbonisation trajectory for the grid emission factor, or yeah, just if you could give yeah. us a little bit of context there. Sorry, two questions. Yeah, no, that's that's okay. And actually, uh, you've asked me something that I should have um, uh, I'd meant to make clear at the beginning. So, first of all, this this particular system is not a diffuser based system. Oh, so it's a, of course, I it's should a have picked that up. Mechanical Sorry. aerator, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and because I'm not, uh, the, there's more details at the company's website. It's listed there, but I, I'm presenting on parts of the university, so I'm not trying to um, to, to sell the technology or anything. So. Uh, and because of the nature of this technology, maintenance issues would be absolutely certainly negligible. If you're looking at a diffuser-based system, eh, what you have said is very true. You would need to look at diffuser fouling and try and estimate how that impacts oxygen transfer efficiency, because that is by far, that and the electricity grid efficiency are the two key inputs to this model. That's what we've seen. And that will matter, no matter that, that would be the same for all aeration systems. And you would also um, have to look for diffuser-based systems. You would have to probably include maintenance um, as well, simply because the maintenance of those systems tend to be a little more complex when they do foul uh, completely. Uh, in terms of grid efficiency, that was a difficult one uh, to model. Um, what we did was we used the residual en energy mix for the country for their latest data. We tried to, it is possible to model what they are projecting, any country is projecting their energy grid might look like in 2030, 2040, 2050, etc. But there's a lot of uncertainty around that data. And um, we, for the purposes of this presentation, I just presented the the latest residual energy mix for that particular country. Um, I, I would say that in terms of the what it will do is reduce the actual uh, impacts that we calculated, assuming that the grid does get more efficient over time because the operational part is so 
um, outweighs all the other parts by orders of magnitude, it still means operation is going to be the key um, part of narration systems. Yeah, brilliant. And um, I think Edward, uh, we've got, yeah, Eduardo says what, what becomes the predominant element with a fully decarbonized grid. And then Emily's asking um, <clears throat> how many of the challenges you've cited would be addressed by requiring that vendors provide EPDs. So two quick ones, and I think we've got yeah. time for those, if that's all right. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. Okay, I'll start with EPDs. I think that's going to be very helpful. I do I do worry about, a little bit about it at this stage because life cycle assessment modeling is challenging and the data, um, you know, you need to be sure that the, the companies are providing accurate models because if you're going to use it as part of a tendering decision, then it needs to be, um, you need to have a certain level of quality control. But yes, ultimately, I think it should be, and I think hopefully it will be. And um, uh, sorry, the, the second question was the predominant element. I still think actually operation is still the predominant element, because even if your grid is completely uh, carbon neutral, you're still paying for electricity anyway. So operational control, flexibility, and duration system is um, key. But let's say in terms of impacts, um, I still think it's uh, it's still key for other reasons I might not go into today. But if you if we ignore the operation element, then we're talking about in the case of deaeration technology, the fabrication, and uh, uh, the steel manufacture. There are the two key parts. Transport, I think, almost in almost all circumstances, is going to be a very small component of the technology's carbon um, outputs and total impacts, not just carbon. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Owen. That was fantastic. And with that, I um, we will pass across to Maria. Thanks. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Maria, and I am a SNEL CA and Sustainability Specialist at Campbell. Today, I'm going to present uh, this study um, entitled LCA in Energy and Resource Recovery Upgrades, the Varga Project. And this study was actually part of my PhD project that I did, that I carried out uh, during my PhD studies at DTU. Uh, and VARGA stands for um, actually Water Resource Recovery Facility, and it's an acronym for uh, the, the Danish word of Water Resource Recovery Facility. So but, but a little bit about myself, so just briefly, so I'm an environmental engineer. I have a double master, basically, one for from the Polytechnico in Milano and another one from the Technical University of Denmark. Um, after my studies, uh, I have uh, been a research assistant for two years at the Technical University of Denmark and then I carried out a PhD. Um, this PhD was actually industrially funded by these uh, three Danish water and wastewater utilities, Oros, Van, Van Sintasul and Biofos. Um, basically, the PhD focused on life cycle assessment and socio-economic assessment of water, of wastewater treatment and resource recovery facilities and in addressing whether we are moving towards more uh, sustainable plans. And uh, it's been almost a year, so I have been also working full time as a LCA specialist at Ampli. So um, the reason why I talked uh, about LCA and I actually use and apply LCA a lot in the wastewater treatment um, plans is because we are transitioning to uh, this concept of water resource recovery facilities. So basically our wastewater treatment is not aimed anymore only to uh, clean the effluent, but also we aim to recover uh, resources. For example, resources in terms of energy, like biogas, electricity, heat, but also nutrients. And also we are trying this uh, new uh, water resource recovery facilities to minimize greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. So we tend to um, think that circular plants are actually sustainable. Uh, although it's very good to be circular, we also need to pay, to pay attention um, on um, basically transitioning to tr circular, circular plants by not increasing, for example, energy consumption or chemicals. And we need, therefore, decision support tools that are able to catch these uh, trade-offs. And uh, one of these uh, methodologies is, of course, life cycle assessment. So uh, now I'm re very lucky because before me, Owen has explained about, li about life cycle assessment. Uh, but briefly, I can tell you also a little bit about it. 
so with the life cycle assessment, we perform an environmental impact assessment. And typically, we tend to use an approach that is a cradle-to-grave approach. With this approach, we inventory all material consumption and emissions along the life cycle of the system from material generation, construction, operation, and final disposal and dismantling. And uh, also, it's very important that we also take into account all the impacts that are coming from the transportation, for example, and as I told you, all the emissions, the direct, direct emissions to the environment, especially, for example, very relevant, relevant for a treatment plant, the emissions to water. When we move towards water resource recovery facilities, basically we are also um, generating byproducts uh, or co-products. For example, we are producing energy or we are uh, recovering our sludge uh, as a fertilizer. And therefore, it's also important that we take into account the co-products in our LCA. That means, for example, by taking into account of the avoided conventional production of the co-products, for example, avoided conventional energy, heat and electricity production. So this also is, um, uh, is taken into account in, in the LCA. So what we do with the LCA and what I've tried to do in this study is basically to move from only carbon footprint to a broader range of environmental indicators. Um, and as you can see here, this is just an example. Basically, LCA can provide a range of, of around 16 to 18 environmental impact categories. So it's quite a broad environmental footprint we are looking at. Um, and uh, why is that? Well, we need to avoid what we call carbon tunnel vision because indeed we might have some trade-offs or benefits that we cannot see only in the carbon footprint, but we need a more holistic assessment. And this holistic assessment has to also include, for example, the resource consumptions, uh, consumption, for example, of uh, metals and minerals or fossil resources but also the land use or the eutrophication. So this is why I like LCA is because we can actually provide a very holistic assessment. And when we move and, we, and when we assess water resource recovery facilities, we can really answer the question, is this alternative better or more sustainable than another alternative technology? And uh, I mentioned the PhD, I also wanted to tell you that um, all that I'm talking about today is actually published. I have published also other paper papers. The first one was focused on carbon footprint. The second one that I'm talking today is about life cycle assessment and uh, the economy, economic assessment of water resource recovery facilities. And uh, I also focused on sludge pyrolysis where we combined LCA cost and cost benefit analysis. And then finally, because sustainability is not only environmental sustainability, uh, we also try to include socio-technical aspects uh, in the evaluation of water resource recovery facilities. The reason why I mentioned this is because most of this work is open source, and I hope that you will download the articles and read it, and then maybe get back to me if you have any questions. Also, another reason is because today, unfortunately, I cannot go to all the results of this paper too. Uh, so I just chose uh, the most relevant ones, but if you have any questions, please get back to me. So the question that I'm trying to answer today is uh, really how can life cycle assessment support decision makers in select selecting wastewater treatment and resource recovery technologies? And I try to answer this question by uh, showing this example, the retrofitting of an existing wastewater treatment plant to a water resource recovery facility. Specifically, I'm focusing on a treatment plant in Copenhagen, which is um, uh, operated by the uh, by Biofos. Um, this plant has a capacity of 400,000 person equivalent and is already an energy recovery plant. That means that they are already exporting biogas or biomethane and heat. But in 2025, the plan is that this plant becomes even more, it basically it is, it will be transitioned to a, a resource recovery facility completely. And uh, by completely, I mean that the operator is going to act on the water line by installing real-time measurement and control of uh, nitrous oxide emission. They will also have uh, pre-filtration technologies in order to increase the production of uh, the, yeah, the production of primary sludge and therefore enhance the biogas production 
and then also anamox uh, in order to reduce the nitrogen load to the aeration. And uh, in the sludge line instead, what uh, it was evaluated, um, it was basically evaluated the combination of upgrading the biogas with biomethanation plus uh, hydrogen production. That means that we can generate more biomethane. And in the waste management part, instead the idea is to recover phosphorus, sand and other metals from sludge ashes because biophos uh, currently is incinerated in the sludge and therefore it could be nice to valorize um, the phosphorus that is contained in the ash. Uh, as you can see, this system is very complex, so we are moving towards very complex facilities and is not enough to say we want to recover these resources. We also need to evaluate if we are doing it in a sustainable way. So I'm trying to answer this question, are these technologies sustainable uh, by applying life cycle assessment? And uh, today I want to show you just um, uh, two graphs. So basically I want to show you the carbon footprint results and then the results of the depletion of resources, the minerals and metals. It's because here we can really see the trade-offs. So I have to explain you a little bit the graphs. So the positive uh, numbers mean uh, uh, mean a burden for the environment, um, that it's not good for the environment, while the negative impacts uh, mean avoided impacts. So if we uh, look at this uh, line here, you can see that if we start from the baseline treatment plant and we increase uh, the number of resource recovery technologies in the plant, then you can see that more or less we are uh, decreasing the carbon footprint. Of course, there are some variation. And also you can see that the most contributing parameters here in red is uh, nitrous oxide, um, which is basically uh, decreased as soon as we implement more monitoring and control of nitrous oxide with the sensors. But what I want you to show is to focus on this alternative, for example, alternative number three. In this alternative, we are uh, also uh, producing hydrogen and combining it uh, with CO2 from anaerobic digestion uh, in order to produce more biomethane. So as you can see here in the carbon footprint graph, we can see that we are actually decreasing the carbon footprint with an additional uh, 20%. Um, but when you look at the depletion of resources, instead we see an opposite result. That means that we are uh, the increasing the impacts um, of um, minerals and, and metals depletion by 93%. That is due to the fact that uh, the assumption is that hydrogen production is based on wind, meaning the electricity required for the hydrogen production is based on, on, on wind, therefore renewable energy which um, has a positive effect on the carbon footprint, but on the other side has a negative effect on the minerals and metals. So in order to counter, counterbalance this uh, negative impacts uh, in the, in, uh, from the hydrogen production, then in the next alternative, uh, we have evaluated the phosphorus recovery from ash. Uh, in this case, in the carbon footprint here, you cannot really see an improvement or very small, so not significant. But when we look, we look at the other graph, so uh, the, the graph of the minerals and metals, then you can see that we are actually avoiding quite a lot of impacts because conventional production of phosphorus is based on phosphate rocks. So here you are able to see what is actually uh, decreasing carbon footprint and what is increasing the impacts of the minerals and metals, metals and what are the technologies that, that work best. Overall, I have to see that when we implement all the technology all together, then we are actually in general decreasing the impacts compared to our basin plant. plant. So these are just two examples from the results, but I have many more. For example, the graph on the freshwater eutrophication, which I do not show it here, but it's uh, in the paper. Uh, but beyond the, um, beyond the uh, environmental impact assessment, we also have done an economic assessment. And uh, there is also a difference. First of all, I want to 
show you that as soon as we implement more research recovery technologies, we are also making uh, making our plant more expensive in a way, I mean, meaning that uh, implementing research recovery is not cheap, but there are some technologies which are uh, more cost effective than others. For example, the sensors um, for nitrous oxide um, measurement and control. Um, here we have calculated an abatement cost of two euro per ton CO2 equivalent avoided. Uh, so which is which is a great number. So it's not uh, very expensive, but it's also very cost effective. And then we have other technologies such as the production of hydrogen coupled with the biomethanation, um, which is actually quite expensive per ton CO2 equivalent avoided, as well as the prefiltration. So if uh, really, if water utilities have to move towards water resource recovery facilities, probably they also need subsidies. And yeah, because if this is also a, a quite expensive um, business in a way. So I just want to give you some conclusions. Um, so in general, from the life cycle assessment that we carried out here, we could see that retrofitting a treatment plant to a resource recovery facility in general, decrease the, decrease the impacts. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions. That's mostly due, for example, to the additional chemicals consumption that we generated and that impacted, for example, freshwater eutrophication. But in general, most of the impact categories show an improvement. And uh, uh, what really worked in this case, it was not really the single technology, but the interplay of the different types of technologies. So, for example, if the hydrogen with the biomethanation decreased the climate change, at the same time increased the demand of mineral resources. And therefore, by coupling the phosphorus recovery technology, we could offset the increase of the in, of impacts in depletion, in the depletion of abiotic resources categories. Then the economic value, as I told you, the economic value decreased uh, compared to the baseline. So it is expensive. Uh, but at the same time, there are some technologies like the real-time monitoring, monitoring and control, which uh, which did not significantly increase the value, the, the decrease the economic value, and they were cost-effective, especially if we compare it by how many tons of CO two equivalent they were uh, reducing. So uh, this was my last slide. I want to thank you for your attention, and I also want to thank all the project partners which you can see here in the slide, and also my workplace, Rumble, for funding the time that's spent here at the webinar. Yes, thank, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks so much, Maria. Um, and we have a few questions also, um, a few minutes for questions too. Um, there's one here, and I think you've I perhaps answered it already, but the the um, that increase from the materials use, it was the, was it the um, minerals and metals for wind turbine production, Emily's asking, Yes, it was. Yes, it's exactly that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that's, and that was a short answer, but yes, uh, yeah. well spotted. Yeah. And um, one other one other question I had is the um, the choice. Or oh, you you mentioned some of those ranges, and I guess with regards to uncertainty, and also um, Owen touched on this too. Is you know these 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 analyses are complex and challenging. What is the, um, in your in your view, what is the best way to address, like how do you address uncertainty? And I guess from a utilities perspective or a who aren't perhaps, you know, doing a PhD on this, what are, what would be your yeah. recommendations there? And what's the best way to try to um, make, keep this science-based um, with the tools that are available? Uh, that's a very good question because indeed uncertainty is uh, is high in some of the studies. Uh, so from my perspective, if I look at this study, what I did is to re really uh, have quite a lot of discussion with the water utilities and also with the project partners here uh, involved. So I tried to validate the data by asking directly, what is your experience? Can you provide some data from another similar case study, for example? So that's a way of addressing um, and trying to validate the data that, that you use in a way. But actually, most of the data I used in this case are, I would say, well validated. Still, there are some uncertainties. For example, the methane potential is, is yeah, was a little bit, uh, yeah, um, theoretical estimate. Uh, but in general, I feel that by asking, um, you, you can get actually quite a lot. Um, 
And then uh, typically you have to make several iterations. Um, you, I, I think I, I can't remember how many iterations of this study I've done, but there is always uh, something new that comes up after after you discuss the results with the with the collaborators in, in the project. Yeah. Thanks very much, Maria. And just to be clear then, so the data, the inputs, um, they were piloting all of these, they were piloting all of these resource recovery yeah. treatment so, trains, weren't they? Or most of them, is that right? For example, the uh, real-time measurement and control, they are based on real uh, data, so the real measurements. And uh, I talked a lot with Nico from Unison and I got data from him. So they were actually real data. Uh, and also, I was lucky enough because at the same time, they published uh, the study on the monitoring and the control strategies, which I could refer in the, in the, in the article. So, yeah, it was real data. And the biomethane, the other resource recovery, they were piloting some of these as well. So some of this yes. was based on actual, they were all part of the Lighthouse Project Barger, I think, weren't they? For example, the biomethanation, they had a pilot uh, with the electrochia, uh, I think, now I don't want to mentioned <laughs> very companies but yeah that's yeah uh, brilliant that's, that's what happened and i got results uh, from reports which were published yeah fantastic look thank you so much um very much a great another great presentation and with that um we will pass across to Jakob. thanks very much and inga thank you very much both Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, my name is uh, Jakob. I'm working uh, at a consultant company called uh, Invidain, um, who's, uh, who's doing work within the entire uh, water circle and primarily uh, in the Scandinavian countries. I'm also here on uh, behalf of uh, Inge Halkjær Jensen, who is uh, working at uh, Aarhus Vand, uh, which is the second largest uh, utility company in uh, Denmark. And she's the project director for Aarhus Rewater, um, which is the very uh, exciting and groundbreaking project um, I will be talking about today. Uh, and I will especially focus on on sustainability as a driver for you, Aarhus Rewater and tell about how sustainability has been a part of the project from the from the very beginning. Um, yeah, and it, it actually goes back uh, around uh, six years where uh, the, the, the utility made this rewater prospectus and they actually invited uh, the entire water sector from Denmark and, and beyond into uh, uh, to come and, and have a talk uh, to, to see what they were doing and, and to hear about the, uh, the aims, the ideas, the dreams of this Aarhus free water. And the idea is that they are to build a, a new wastewater treatment plant or a waste resource recovery facility by 2028 with a capacity of uh, 480,000 PE and with the possibility of increasing that capacity to 600,000 PE. And three of their old wastewater treatment plants have to be de decommissioned in, in, this, uh, in this project also. There was a huge, huge uh, focus on resource recovery, sustainability, and innovation. And you can see some of the, the pictures here that one of the aims were to make this, uh, this project um, rewater to, to be one of the most resource, or the world's most resource efficient wastewater treatment plant. And they want uh, to make something that everybody could look at and be inspired by. Yeah, and um, they did. Uh, the utility made this uh, tender where they wanted to create this process consortium who could work together with the utility and together with the contractor to uh, to reach these uh, these goals and, and aims of the project. And uh, we in uh, in Bidane, uh, went together with. Um, uh, Royal Haskell and DHV and KWR from the Netherlands uh, as a process consortium working together with uh, Oswen um, and together with a contractor called uh, Orslev. If you can uh, change to the next slide, please. Yeah, so we together uh, are working right now to to try to to make these uh, these promises and, and to create the most uh, resource efficient uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant in the world. Um, from the very beginning, we were looking a lot into um, to uh, not only creating a wastewater treatment plan for 2028 or for 
2040, but also for 2050, 2060. How could we look into a future? Where would we, where would we be in in, uh, in not only a, a, a near future, but also looking a little a little bit more ahead? Um, and we did a lot of work on this and looking into what should we uh, try to embrace already now for us to be able to be uh, to be ready for the for the future um, problems or challenges that would come. And these are three of the things, three scenarios or guiding stars for the entire project that we developed. Um, the first one was a scenario called Stay Cool, where we looked a lot into the, the whole uh, yeah, greenhouse gas emission, trying to, to reduce uh, greenhouse gases, but also see if we could do carbon capture in order to really embrace this, um, this theme. Um, also, as I already mentioned, uh, resources, we created this scenario called Resourceful uh, in order to look at a wastewater treatment plant, not only as a place for reducing nutrients to the uh, receiving water bodies, but also to see if we could make some uh, valuable uh, products that could be used uh, in society. And then also, uh, very importantly, uh, the last scenario, talking about valuing water, uh, we're looking into a future, future where water could be a, um, a resource that... Uh, that is not um, yeah that we that we have less of uh, at least the, the clean the clean water. Uh, we should look more into reuse of water. Maybe we could use the the, um, the treated wastewater for for something better than to just discharging into the environment. Um, it also looks into um, how we can reduce the emissions to the receiving water bodies and and make biodiversity and stuff like that. So this was also very. Very interesting part of the, the the beginning of the project to to try and, uh, and look a little bit more um, holistic on it and then uh, look at the perspectives uh, within the, uh, the, the the whole water circle. Um, we also worked a lot on uh, on the sustainable development goals. Um, Use that as a starting point for introducing sustainability into the project. Um, and it was also used as a, as a common language for all the partners in the project. <clears throat> uh, Van has been working with uh, the, the SDGs for quite some time, and they're actually certified in, in four of the SDGs. And we look further into, uh, especially, specifically for this project for Aarhus Rewater, could we, uh, could we do more here? And we actually added four more SDGs that we are working actively uh, with uh, within the project. Um, yeah, next slide, please. We also looked into um, something called innovation challenges. And this was actually something that Aarhus Van uh, already uh, was working on from the very beginning of the project. In the prospectus, they were looking in how can we solve different challenges that we have in society. And some of that could be uh, non-technology specific. It could be about how do we integrate the wastewater treatment plant in the in the city, how do we get the uh, citizens to come and, and visit and, and learn from this uh, this facility? And it could be from the technological side um, with how to reduce nutrients into the receiving water bodies, how to reduce CO2 emissions, energy consumption, and stuff like that. And we worked a lot with these innovation challenges and actually tried to take them from challenges into specific project goals that we could set up and then all the time try to evaluate whether we actually um, yeah, could reach these uh, these goals and thereby uh, yeah, live up to these innovation challenges. Um, one of the uh, tools that we have uh, used in this um, in that in that part of the project was this uh, model called sustained which you see in the in the left hand side uh, it's a iterative uh, process where we start out by uh, by mapping the issue, if we're talking about uh, environmental sustainability, for example, then we're looking into what are all the consumptions at the at the wastewater treatment plants, what are all the emissions. Then we we evaluate all these emissions, prioritize, and based on the prioritization, we then um, set specific goals. And one of the goals I showed at the top hand right hand corner, um, setting a goal, especially for uh, uh, CO two reduction. So. This one says, how do we achieve energy and CO2 neutrality in the water cycle throughout Mercedes Bore catchment? So trying to be much more specific on what we actually want to receive. And when we have that goal set, 
then we can start to implement or put on different technologies to see if we then can uh, live up to these uh, uh, live up to these goals. And that's, an, as I said, an iterative process because you might not always get what you want by implementing uh, certain technologies. Maybe you need to go back and, and rethink or see if you can uh, implement something else or do some optimizations in the systems. Um, yeah, so what we did for this specific project in, uh, in Aarhus Rewater, we were looking into this uh, big bat, we call it bat catalog, uh, best available technologies which actually both includes bad technologies, but also includes more uh, newer technologies, which are not, um, which doesn't have a very high uh, technology readiness level, but could be something interesting for uh, a, a near future. We looked into this catalog with more than 100 uh, technologies, and then through a, a series of workshops, trying to narrow down and try to uh, put technologies together to build these technological concepts that you see in the in the bottom right hand corner here, uh, we actually ended up with four different technological concepts. And these four technological concepts, we then had to look into a broader evaluation method in order to see which of these concepts were actually performing better for this, um, yeah, for what we want for the rewater plant in 2028. And one of the um, one of the tools, evaluation tools that we used, is uh, life cycle assessment, which you see on the next hand slide, next slide. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that because Ewan and, and Maria has, has done a great job introducing you to this. Just to say that we did a, a, a full uh, LCA on these four different uh, technological concepts in order to see what was the environmental performance of these uh, different concepts. We also, uh, apart from the life cycle assessment, we look even broader. In the next slide, you can see uh, a table with a, this is a multi-criteria analysis that we used as an evaluation method. As you can see, we both looked into the environmental sustainability, where we used the LCA as a, an evaluation tool. We looked into economical sustainability, looked both at OPEX, CAPEX, also did some net present value models to calculate. Uh, and then we also looked a little bit into social sustainability and some technical criteria. Uh, and for the technical criteria, <clears throat> you can see them here in the bottom of the, the table. Complexity, adaptability, modularization, and flexibility. Here we, we used uh, an expert um, evaluation group um, to, to look into that because it's very difficult to, to quantify. So here's more like a qualitative uh, assessment of these uh, criteria. So this was actually what we, we've done a lot of work on in the beginning to do look at these technical things to choose the technologies for the rewater projects. Um, in the next phase of the project, we will focus more on, I'll just, if you can go one slide back, please. Uh, we'll look at a lot more into uh, landscaping, green areas, wetlands, uh, covered plants, uh, biodiversity, but also a bit more into to health and uh, and safety. So we're we're not we're not done with all these things and and this iterative process uh, where we want to uh, all the time optimize um, optimize everything within sustainability. Yeah, and the next slide shows something that we have also done on the on the side of this entire work that I've already uh, presented. Um, we've been looking into a BREAM certification, so a certification scheme within uh, environmental sustainability, um, where you look at eight different categories, um, which contains uh, around 250 criteria that has to be evaluated. And and. This is, is quite some work, but it really it's a it's a very good process because it it gets you to think, <laughs> it gets you to uh, make sure that you don't miss anything. You need to go through all of these criteria, but it's not just a checklist. You also really get to think and see if you can actually do things better. Uh, and that's also, of course, one of the uh, the the things that you want from this that you can all the time improve. Uh, the project within sustainability. Also, it acts like a, a documentation for, for the project that you have actually done what you could uh, in terms of sustainability. So it's, it's something that could be of interest, um, especially on, on these quite large projects. Yeah, 
Next slide, please. Um, yeah, just a few pictures here on, on, on some of the work that is it's ongoing, but we have to be a little bit more specific on this right now. Um, there's also an architect which is uh, in the project now, Nils Henning Larsen Architects, uh, and they're working a lot on this, uh, the landscaping, the, the areas on the uh, wastewater treatment facility. How can we um, how can we make it uh, green, lush? How can we make people to interact? How can we leave areas for biodiversity? Um, so that's also a, a large part of the of the project. Um, as I said, we've been going on for <laughs> the, the ideas. Uh, the ideas go even much more back than than six years ago. But that was where it actually really took. Uh, uh, took speed. Um, if you take the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so we've learned a lot now. We still have uh, a few more years before we we are we are building, um, but we have to to be ready by uh, around 2028. Um, some of the conclusions you can say that um, we want to tell with this story is that it's very important that you uh, build sustainability into the projects. I mean, from day one. And it's not something that you start thinking about when when you have to to build something. It's really much something that you use in the planning phase. Um, you really need to work systematic and holistic during the entire project as execution. Uh, you could consider this, as I said, the BREEAM or some other certification scheme um, that could actually be a good process for the uh, implementing sustainability and also a good documentation tool. Um, I didn't mention a lot about resource recovery. We've been working a lot of this uh, on this in the in the project, looking at many different possible uh, resources to to take out from the wastewater uh, from the wastewater or the sludge. Uh, we've developed different um, models um, where we look into resource maturity index, look into resource recovery potential. How does this look now? How does it look in the in the near future? And and, and what could be interesting for this uh, specific wastewater treatment plan to to go for? Um, yeah, and now we're moving into the more specific design phases, and and the focus is still on sustainability, innovation. Um, so, so these, uh, yeah, this about sustainability really it's, it's going to be with the project uh, all the time also when the plant is is implemented and, and being operated um so really a yeah groundbreaking project from uh, in, in in the danish wastewater sector um yeah and thank you very much thank you to the to the partners and, and thank you also to uh, to inge um the the project director Thank thanks you. very much. Over thanks to you, very much, Jacob. Yeah, thank you. Um, and that was yeah, really fascinating, practical example of, as you say, a really innovative um, project that's trying to do the best, absolutely the best by sustainability. Um, what's I guess um, yeah, if anyone has questions, please raise them in the Q and A box. But um, one I one um, I had, and then we'll go to perhaps a general discussion and reflections. But um, when when we look at the um, the sort of you know, the, the LCAs that have been presented also by Owen and um, Maria, which have obviously been founded on academic, you know, studies and um, in Maria's case, you know, a very substantive PhD. What do you see as the main challenges? Like you're, a, um, you know, you're a practitioner in uh, Forenvian and um, this is a really nice example of how as practitioners we can apply LCA, um, but you know, it's not going to be in, in the same way as a, a four-year PhD. So I just wondered what, what are your reflections on that or um, what what did you learn along the way or how did you engage? Uh, I mean, maybe actually there was academics involved in this. I'm not really sure. So, yeah, be interested interested yeah. on what how it happened in practice to inspire mm -hmm. other utilities. Yeah, good uh, good question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know Maria's work and I know that, I mean, it, could, it can take years to do a... <laughs> A, a good LCA and look into the really look into the data. Maybe make some new data. Sometimes it can take a, a very long time. And of course, you need to on a project like this, you need to um, to uh, be pragmatic and 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 look into what is what is the what is the aim of what you're doing. And of course, we sometimes have to 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 do. Um, more quick and dirty work compared to what Maria has been uh, presenting today. Um, but all the time, look at what, what are we actually looking at for this 
specific purpose we were looking into uh, comparing different concepts. So sometimes we could say that, okay, this part of the, the plant or this part of the plant, they're actually more or less the same. So all the time, and then we didn't have to, to model that part. So all the time looking to, do we need to go into um, very much of detail for this? All the time uh, balancing and, and, and trying to, to figure out what is the most significant uh, processes um, and then go about it like that. Um, so, so maybe sometimes cutting corners um, because you cannot, I mean, uh, you cannot spend three years in a project like this. Uh, and when you have smaller projects, I mean, you, you need to do some much more assumptions and, and, and may, maybe make the system a little bit more simple. Um, yeah. I hope that uh, somewhat uh, answers your question. Yeah, no, I think this is great. And I guess in time, I mean, this is very much still ongoing. So in time, you got there will be some published information as well that I think will be really nice for people to draw upon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, brilliant. Thank you. All right. Well, there's, there's a few final slides that I just wanted to, um, to talk through where really we've tried to um, actually summarise the... the or bring in a lot of the a lot of what we've talked about today, um, but also provide a bit of a utility specific uh, greenhouse gas um, assessment or a document, a white paper that explains what greenhouse gases we should be considering, but then also going beyond just considering carbon and what else uh, should we be thinking about, and in particular providing some signposts to exactly these life cycle assessment um, approaches. Uh, that we've heard about today. So this is a this is a document that was prepared by. Um, it's available online, and it was um, I guess prepared by a working group um, within the Climate Smart Utilities Greenhouse Gas Monitoring Subgroup, which I have the pleasure to lead. And so a small group of us from uh, from that subgroup uh, got together and very much inspired by what we've heard today and by the Nordic principles um, that we started off the webinar series with. Um, but in particular, the um, diving into process emissions, given how relevant we know they are, but also how we're using uh, carbon in, in wider decision making. We've, we've developed this um, a, a publication, so it's a, a fairly short white paper, although it's probably, and the idea is it's uh, aimed at utilities to really try to provide some practical examples, the sort of best evidence we, we have as a group of practitioners. And um, just if, next slide, please. So that's available online. And um, Owen, who we've heard from today, um, has uh, was was a, a lead contributor to this, and we very much reference the work of um, of Maria, of of um, Jakob, and the um, many other projects, uh, as well as the best available research around, for example, process emissions, but actually all scope one, two, and three emissions um, for. Uh, greenhouse gas accounting specifically in water resource recovery facilities. So I just wanted to say thanks to the contributors who were in the working group that we spun out of our subgroup. This is an open subgroup and the working group was also open. So anyone who wanted to be part of it, um, currently we're preparing an, another white paper around nitrous oxide monitoring. So um, if anyone is interested to be part of this also, I think um, it's open to, yeah, I think I were members, but I think also we very much welcome contacts with um, with other global organisations. So I'd say we would always find a way of getting you involved. Um, but thanks to the contributors, uh, Owen, Connell, uh, Alexi, uh, Daniel, Martin, Corinne and Liu. And um, very much thank you to, uh, to, to Benedetta, Brenda and Charles from the IWA team who helped us um, bring this document to life. Thanks very much. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to very briefly um, talk through, just give people a little bit of an overview of it. And um, really it's designed to provide some information, but also signposts to a lot of the, the good case studies and um, the best available information that, that we see. Uh, so that's the idea of that was to bring that together into a document. And so we, we talk about the um, emissions of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, sorry, the emissions of greenhouse gases from uh, wastewater management or water resource recovery facilities. Um, there's a few detailed considerations there around um, components of those and in particular a section on the importance of scope one process emissions. Uh, we heard a lot um, in this series, we've had a specific webinar on nitrous oxide and one on methane and um, in the past we've also run some masterclasses on these but I think again we heard today from 
um, well, from Owen on the importance of aeration, and we know aeration has a, a very significant link to um, to nitrous oxide production. And then we heard also from um, Maria, we saw that, that that very significant green bar, which was the impact of um, the or the benefit of introducing um, advanced control to minimise nitrous oxide production. Um, which was so important relative to all of the under all, all the under, other wonderful resource recovery um, options that were explored. Actually, that is so fundamental. So it's really important that we apply the best science as we can um, as practitioners there. So we've tried to focus on that in this guide. Um, and then we go on to the topic of life cycle assessment and Owen's um, really written and uh, contributed to a really good section on that and um, referencing, very much referencing um, Maria's work as, as well. Um, and then we, um, yeah, we reflect a little bit on on um, uh, what this all means. Uh, so just next slide, please. So this is this is the table of contents. And we produced a really, I think, what is a very nice diagram. And thanks to the Iowa team for, um, for supporting this um, because it's it's uh, one of the more one of the most comprehensive ones I think that um, that I've seen around scope one, two, and three emissions specifically to um, water resource recovery facilities. So we focus this on wastewater, uh, and it really lists uh, lists off the key emissions there, and um, in a similar format to the greenhouse gas protocol diagram for folks who are who are familiar with this. And next slide, please. So just another few highlights. Um, there's also some other example, in this case, carbon footprints and system boundaries for um, uh, drinking water, wastewater distribution collection systems and uh, biogas production. So we focus, uh, we highlight two utilities, um, Bergen Water and also um, Aarhus Farm. So there's some, this is just a link within the um, white paper. There's a link to the Iowa Climate Smart Utilities um, landing page and there you can also find some specific information some more information and case studies in this case from the folks at Bergen Water who were very um, very much involved in supporting the, the workshop last year in Copenhagen and really presented some of these diagrams which I think we thought were just really worth sharing because it's an example of a really progressive utility who are really trying to take account for um, in this case the full carbon impacts of their various um, water water cycles next slide please and then um, we also have uh, what I think is a nice diagram and a big thanks to Aarhus, Aarhus Fund and Morton in particular for um, for helping, helping well, sharing this with us. But, um, and this, you know, we think shows a, a nice progressive um, example of greenhouse gas um, uh, accounting um, by a, uh, a water utility. So we see that division of scope one, two and three emissions and then we see, you know, I think the key word is potential avoided emissions um, and the need to keep these separate um, and to be clear that um, we, yeah, we really need to work on of, of really minimising those emissions as everyone needs to get to, uh, to zero emissions. Um, and of course, trying to maximise the avoided emissions, but the focus very much should be on, um, on minimising um, the our scope one, two and three emissions. And when we look at that grey bar there, maybe we should come up with a, a similar the same colour for nitrous oxide in all of this work, but um, that grey bar is nitrous oxide. Um, the orange is methane. So this is um, this is based on some measurement, uh, a quite extensive measurement work that Ahus Fund, um, who we just heard from, of course, with Jakob and Inga, um, have done. So I think this is a nice, again, a reiteration of how important those nitrous oxide emissions are um, when we think about our greenhouse gas emissions. So that's also in the guide. Um, you'll find this. And next slide, please. And then Maria alluded to this, and we've um, there was actually a really nice graphic that was developed um, by that I, uh, I think a few people will have seen on the web somewhere. And we've actually adapted this, and and we've added uh, if you compare the two, you'll see what we've added. But I think we've added some nice things in there. Um, and I guess it's just a, re a reminder that um, as as Maria alluded alluded to and as all the speakers have referred to today we we need to think beyond carbon emissions of course this um you know it is absolutely critical that we act on um on climate um but when we think about the the co um the other factors and the co-benefits and um the other yeah all of the other sustainability indicators um we really you know we really need to be thinking holistically and tools like life cycle assessment that we've heard about today allow us to try to do this. You know, that it's not, we, we can't perfectly apply them each time, but at least we can start to have the conversations we need to that really help will help us make the decisions that are required. Next slide, please. 
And then just to just to finish up on, I mean, we called this webinar um, from process emissions to planetary boundaries. I mean, I think um, I don't if people are familiar with the planetary boundaries uh, concept. It was developed by the Stockholm Resilience Institute and um, a number of really eminent earth science um, leaders, global leaders, including um, Johan Rockström. Uh, and it has been, I think it was developed in 2009 and it really seeks to, I think, uh, well, it seeks to define a safe operating space for humanity within the biosphere that we have. And um, I think it's quite striking when we look at the, um, the nine planetary boundaries of which we are um, transgressing six of them. And this update was re just released a few weeks ago, the 2023 update. Um, but when we when we look at the life cycle impact categories that we've heard um, quite a bit about today, and I know we haven't dived into the, the detail of exactly the definitions of these impact categories, but um, they align really, really nicely, you know, not unexpectedly um, with this planetary boundaries framework where we, we have um, climate change, we have novel entities, which are things like PFAS and microplastics, human created um, uh, things that, that, that stay that are persistent in the environment. We have um, uh, biodiversity, biosphere integrity. Um, we have uh, land use um, system change. We have water planetary boundaries, so both freshwater use and green water. That's water that's available for um, for plants. We've heard quite a bit about nutrients today, and we see we're really in the red when it comes to nitrogen and phosphorus. And of course, there's a link with things like nitrogen recovery and nitrous oxide production there. Um, and then we've also got the, the ones that we haven't yet transgressed, ocean acidification, um, aerosol loading, and, um, and the only positive story, which I think is the stratospheric ozone depletion, where we have actually um, stopped using the, um, the, the pollutants that are causing this, um, that, that cause this. So we, yeah, we need to think very similarly about this in, in terms of fossil fuels, I think. So I guess I just wanted to, yeah, we've, we've mentioned this in the white paper and I think um, it's quite a, also quite a complex um, concept, but I think it aligns nicely with the, um, what we've been discussing today. And it's, um, it's something that's worth uh, reading up on. And there's been an interesting paper um, which we will we can, we can circulate in the minutes uh, in the in the follow up for this webinar, which uh, actually tries to take it down to a bioregional scale, and I think it's a really interesting thought um, along with what we've heard today. So, with that, I think uh, just the final one, just as a reminder, we. Um, there's, uh, we'll, we'll also share the links to these documents, but um, we've got the, the Nordic Principles document, which we mentioned at the beginning, the white paper, which I've just discussed. Um, when it comes to these really important emissions of nitrous oxide and methane, there's a much more detailed book that was published um, by Iowa also, and, um, and a, a number of uh, the global leaders contributed to this. That's also available open source, um, that quantification and modeling of future greenhouse gas emissions. And then there was a series as well as a series that we've just finished now with this final webinar on the um, really Nordic lessons um, around greenhouse gas accounting and wider um, life, cycle, uh, life cycle considerations. We also have a webinar series that was last year um, that was a masterclass on the back of the, the book publication. And that was um, much more of a deep dive into nitrous oxide um, and methane emissions. But um, all of these are available online and we will share the links um, as we post the recording for this webinar. Uh, so I think that was all, um, I think uh, that was all I wanted to say. Um, I think the next slide is, uh, probably what's coming up, but I guess just um, yeah, I, maybe if if all of the panelists were happy to come back on briefly, we've we've got um, just under ten minutes left, and I just wondered um, we don't have any questions. I think that's because we've had lots of put lots of people on the call, but I think um, there's there's probably lots of questions everyone has, but I. I always find this is quite a lot to digest um, and these new approaches aren't, you know, aren't the ones that we're working with every day in our day-to-day -day roles. Um, so I guess maybe what I'll do is ask each of the panellists to just reflect a little bit on what we've discussed today and where you see, um, you know, what should we, uh, yeah, as a sector, as a water sector and as climate, you know, climate smart utilities or supporting climate smart utilities, um, what do we really need to take? What are the sort of take home messages from this? Um, if that's a reasonable ask, and I'm going to start with, um, I guess we could go in order of presentations. Sorry, so sorry, Owen, you're up. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, yeah, I think one of the, the kind of questions or, you know, themes that came up was, you know, how, how can it be 
how can what we've talked about today be applied and used by utilities and practitioners? And I think all three presentations gave examples of that. But it, I think maybe the question uh, in a way should be how will it be applied by practitioners and utilities? Because I think it, it will have to be. So in the case of the one I talked about, the we and uh, were required to give uh, an embodied carbon statement. Now, um, we went down the life cycle analysis approach because from an, from the company's point of view, they also want to be able to look at all the other impacts and be able to use the the outcomes of the model to actually improve both their design process to look at where they can reduce material usage and also contact suppliers, etc., to maybe influence them to improve where they can in terms of efficiency. So, uh, so I guess my take home message is that while and I think Jakob might have mentioned this that while life cycle assessment mightn't be used in every single solitary case and while the depth into which you go into this will vary between you know smaller and larger projects i think it's kind of inevitable that it will have these types of approaches will have to be used and so i guess um whether you're in industry academia or in utilities you are going to have to um give resources to upskilling people um who can do this type of work Brilliant. Thanks. Maria? Yes. Uh, so I actually um, aligned with what Owen has said. Um, so um, I think we will need more and more of this analysis because uh, I don't think we, we can afford anymore to just think uh, in terms of economy, in terms of financial values. So in the future, I think the clients, if I can say like that, uh, let's say the water utilities will be uh, asking for this analysis and we need to provide this type of uh, analysis for them. Um, and also I'm thinking in terms of a future, for example, CO2 tax, uh, if such a tax will be enforced, then we will be obliged to do this and therefore we need to be prepared for it. So I don't think actually um, we are so far away from uh, from from it, meaning that uh, it will happen um, and then I'm thinking that it is true that this analysis like LCA uh, are complex uh, and they require a level of um, uh, knowledge I would say but I also agree with you Amanda that it's not that each time we need a PhD uh, you know otherwise we cannot do these types of, uh, of analysis and provide value for, for what you do with this but I think that what Jacob was saying about uh, about cutting the corners, it's it's exactly true because we need to cut the corners in certain situations, especially when we do not know the performance of specific technologies. But in order to do that, we also need to be able to at least once do this very specific analysis and understand what is important. For example, Eon, uh, Owen sorry, uh, has made this analysis on the aviation and now we know what is important. Um, so in order to kind of... Uh, yeah, remove from the analysis some parameters. We also need specific analysis um, and experience with, with LCA. So, and then a uh, third thing I would say that in order to make it more um, digestible, what is important for me is not much about the result. Of course, it is important, but it's also how you use the results and how you are transparent about the assumptions that you make. So you can cut the corner, but then you also have to write, okay, here I've made a big assumption and in the next iteration when there is more budget and time then we need to put more focus and emphasis on this parameter. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually very optimistic. I think uh, we will get there. Brilliant. Thanks. And Jakob? Yeah, thanks. Now, yeah, I'm, also, I'm, I'm working in the in the Danish water sector and I can see that, that it's actually um, it's starting now to to be more and more common to uh, for for the utilities, but also for the consultants to use life cycle assessment and also multi criteria analysis. Um, and it's 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 very positive. I think it's it's quite difficult at the moment because it's there's so many ways of of doing it, and it's very hard sometimes to to describe how you did a study and and what are you actually reading out from the study. But uh, I can see already now that that the more people than work with than work that the more people that work with this um, and the more studies out there, it's getting easier and easier. So I think it's 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 here to stay these kind of evaluation tools because it's tools that 
I mean, it helps you um, form a, a basis for decisions. And that, that's, we, we, we need to use more of these types of tools, uh, I think. Uh, and then, as I said already, I think we need to, to think in sustainability from, from the very beginning, as early as, as possible. And sometimes maybe also think uh, whether, whether we need to build uh, or whether we can postpone um, investments. Um, because, I mean, that, that could really uh, save a lot of emissions if, uh, if we uh, maintained some wastewater treatment plants, if we can do that instead of building a completely new plant. Um, um, so that's really in the planning stage. What, what can we do to, to, uh, to do uh, and make sustainable uh, decisions? Um, yeah. Thanks. Brilliant. I think this is a really nice place to, yeah, to leave it. And um, I think it's a challenge for all of us. And I think we've had some, yeah, really progressive experience in this series and the opportunity for all of those listening in and all of those who will listen in on the recording is to um, inform, I think, inform ourselves and learn and, and really do our best to try to bring at least these discussion to the table um as we as we work in our day jobs so thank you huge thanks to to Jakob maria and owen and um and inga and anna katrine who's helped organize this with myself and Jakob and all of the iowa team um just a few closing slides here on upcoming events there's two webinar or there's one webinar and one meeting there that you are very welcome to be part of and the link is is there um and then a super interesting phd opportunity if anyone's feeling like uh, working in the field of financing climate resilient water utilities, which is uh, looks fascinating. Um, application deadline is there, and there's more information there as well. Um, great, uh, great university as well. And then a final one: please join our network of water professionals. Uh, here's your twenty percent discount, and um, if you join, you can. Um, you can always listen to these webinars because they're free, but you can um, be part of much more as well. So please think about that. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks to everyone and, and to everyone behind the scenes as well. And with that, uh, have a, a lovely uh, morning or afternoon or evening. And um, yeah, we, we wish you a, uh, best wishes and thanks for joining.